Hello class, the topic of today's lecture is Elizabethan sonneteers. We'll be looking at four poets, Samuel Daniel, Michael Drayton, Richard Barnfield, and Folk Greville. Uh, Samuel Daniel and Michael Drayton being two um, significant uh, poets of the Renaissance, very well known at the time. And we're going to start by taking a look at important biographical details about these men, starting with Samuel Daniel. I'm, I'm presenting them um, not in order of birth, but in order of the publication dates of their sonnets. So Samuel Daniel's sequence, Delia, came first, so we're going to start with him, talk about his life a little bit. Born in 1562 in Somerset, southwest England. Um, one of several important Renaissance poets actually born in the early 1560s. Uh, Michael Drayton, um, also born um, in the early 1560s. Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare. Uh, just, uh, it's really pretty, pretty striking how many um, major literary figures were born just within the space of a few years uh, in the early 1560s. By 1581, he had entered Magdalen College, Oxford, as a commoner, um, but he, he, he did not complete his degree. Um, he, he did make an important connection there, however, uh, with the Italian humanist John Florio, who was a scholar, a tutor of languages, and a lexicographer. He... Um, he, he put together the first Italian English dictionary. And by the late 1580s, uh, Samuel Daniel is traveling in Europe um, with members of, uh, with figures from Elizabeth's court. He's, he's traveling in France and Italy, no doubt, learning the language and, and certainly uh, reading the poetry and, and, and feeling inspired by it because by 1591, he has written a number of sonnets called the Delia Sonnets, and these were um, first published in an unauthorized edition of Sidney's Astrophil and Stella, published by a man named Matthew Lunas. We'll talk more about this, um, about, about the publication of these sonnets um, and and how Samuel Daniel um, uh, dealt with the consequences of that and his relationship with Sidney's sister, Mary Herbert, a little later. The complete sequence of sonnets, of Delia's sonnets, was published a year later um, in 1592 with another long poem, The Complaint of Rosamond, uh, and the whole was dedicated to Sidney's sister, the Countess of Pembroke. And we'll be revisiting that. Uh, he became a tutor to uh, Mary Herbert's son, uh, William Herbert, uh, at Wilton House. Um, and uh, under, under, under Pembroke's patronage, he would publish a play, The Tragedy of Cleopatra. And probably while he was there, uh, he, he encountered Spencer Drayton, and other, uh, other literati uh, known as the Wilton Circle. Wilton House, a, a, major, a major center of um, poetic patronage in the 1590s. Wilton House was um, formerly a, uh, a monastery, Wilton Abbey, and in 1539, King Henry VIII, who had just broke from the Catholic Church, um, gave uh, gave the gave the property. He he distributed lots of ecclesiastical properties to aristocrats at the time, and that's how um, the property uh, Wilton House came into the possession of the Pembrokes. In 1595, he, or by 1595, he, he had left Wilton House uh, and secured the patronage of Robert Devereux and his sister Penelope Rich's lover, 
Charles Blunt. We talked about them, um, both of these uh, individuals in the lecture on Sir Philip Sidney. And during this time, he begins a project that he would continue to work on well into the Jacobean period, his civil wars between the two houses of Lancaster and York. This was a historical epic in Arima, basically telling the same story that Shakespeare told in his Henry VI cycle of plays. And in fact, uh, we know that Shakespeare closely read uh, Daniel's Civil Wars because of some of the revisions that he made to the Henry VI plays in response to that reading. He also, during this period, published a verse colloquy on the value of poetry and, and poetic endeavor called Musophilus, and I'm mentioning it here because he dedicated it to Fulk Greville, another one of the poets that we'll be talking about later in this presentation. Starting in 1601, he began publishing um, collected editions of his poetry. The works of Samuel Daniel in 1601, which was followed by certain small poems in 1605, and then certain small works in 1607. Making a... Um, publishing these books, um, um, sort of making a living from the publication of his literary works, which was something that, um, that aristocrats like Sidney and Fulk Greville uh, refused, consciously refused to do. And we'll talk about that when we get to Fulk Greville and the changing understanding of authorship in the Renaissance. In 1603, he published an important uh, piece of um, literary theory called A Defense of Rhyme and dedicated it to his former tutee, William Herbert, and succeeds at this time in securing the patronage of King James I, um, who had acceded to the throne after the death of Queen Elizabeth, um, and becomes essentially the unofficial poet laureate of court, uh, writing court masks and occasional poetry for the royal household. In 1605, something of a controversy, uh, he publishes um, a classical tragedy called Philatus, and it's controversial because of the perceived links in that play, um, the allusions to his former patron, Robert Devereux, who... Um, had attempted to foment a rebellion against against the queen, um, and it was exposed, and he was executed for it in 1601. And this caused some embarrassment for Daniel. There was an investigation. He was brought before the king's privy council, and um, he ultimately wasn't charged with anything, but the humiliation, um, the embarrassment, really, really marked a low point in his literary fortunes. The final eight-book version of Civil Wars appeared um, in 1609, dedicated to the Countess of Pembroke. Um, he had also completed a six-book version of it that was dedicated to Queen Elizabeth, but when this final eight-book version came out, uh, he dedicated it to the Countess of Pembroke, and he would, he would then spend um, the last decade of his life mostly working on a prose history of England, which he did not complete, had not completed, when he died in 1619. So we'll switch now to talking about, to talk about Michael Drayton. There he is. This portrait is in the National Portrait Gallery, London. Um, Kind of, a, kind of a funny looking portrait, um, just drowning in that rough there. He was born in 1563 in Warwickshire in the West Midlands and entered service as a page in the household of a man named Sir Henry Goodyear, whose daughter Anne has been put forward as the most plausible candidate for the identity of the beloved idea in his sonnet sequence, Ideas Mirror. 
1593, he published an imitation of Spencer's shepherd's calendar um, called Idea, the Shepherd's Garland. It consisted of a series of eclogues in which Drayton uh, figures himself as a shepherd named Roland, very similar to the way uh, Spencer's surrogate is Colin Clout in the shepherd's calendar. And then a year later, in 1594, he published a sequence of 51 sonnets, although he does not call them sonnets, he calls them contorzanes, called Ideas Mirror. When he published it again in 1599, he shortened the title to just Idea. And this collection of sonnets went through some substantial changes over the course of Drayton's career. And by 1619, it had expanded from 51 to 63 sonnets, but um, it contained only 21 of the sonnets that originally appeared in 1594. And we're going to take a closer look at, at that later in this lecture. Uh, in 1595, he published an apillion or, or a mini epic um, called Endymion and Phoebe. This was um, very much in the vein of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis and Marlowe's Hero and Leander. In 1597, he did something I think a lot more original when he, when he published England's heroical, epis heroical epistles this was a series of verse letters and heroic couplets exchanged between uh, famous lovers in English history. For example, I think there are there there, there are letters between uh, Eleanor and the Duke of Gloucester, for example, um, and oh. I'm struggling to recall right now, but these these verse letters were modeled after uh, the Latin poet Ovid's Heroides, which uh, which had been translated several decades earlier, I think, by Turberville. From 1597 to 1602, a uh, Drayton um, was in London writing plays for um, for a theater manager named Philip Henslow, a very, very famous theater manager, writing house plays for his company, The Admiral's Men. Um, it's believed that he wrote many, um, but only one of these survives, and it was a collaborative effort. In 1603, he brought out a... a um, um, uh, the, the first in a series of several historical epic poems in Out of a Rima, very much like Samuel Daniel's Civil War. He called his The Baron's Wars. Um, and, and this, like I said, is the first of several that, uh, that he wrote in his lifetime. And like Samuel Daniel, starting in the first decade of the 17th century, he began publishing collections of his poems, uh, the first appearing in 1605, followed in 1606 by poems Lyric and Pastoral, which is an important collection because it contains the earliest uh, odes in English. From 1613 to 1622, he is busy working on his major, um, his major achievement, which is this encyclopedic poem called the Polyalbion. Um, he published the first, the first 18 cantos um, and cumulatively something like 15, some 15,000 lines or so. And it's it's uh, a strange, sort of a, a strange poem, uh, a geographical epic. It, it presents a, a county by county geographical, historical, and ethnographic survey of England. And by uh, 1622, it had been expanded to 30 cantos or songs that, in fact, covered um, every county in England. And he was going to expand it to Scotland, but was unable to do it in his lifetime. In 1619, a folio edition of his poems came out. And the significance of that is that folios were um, expensive to produce. Um, and therefore, you needed to to, to 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 be able to count on 
sales to be profitable. So the fact that a folio edition of the poems had come out uh, is really a test testimony to um, Michael Drayton's fame at the time. Shakespeare's folio of plays would come out in 1623, a few years later. In 1627, he published um, a, a, a romance called Nymphidia, the Court of Fairy, that was immensely popular. And then his last book called Muses, the, the Muses Elysium, which was a return to the pastoral that um, launched his career, a series of 10 pastorals. Uh, he calls them their nymphals. And then he died in 1631 and was buried in Poet's Corner of Westminster Abbey. Richard Barnfield is a little different. We have few details of, of his life, um, and his, his precocious literary output was confined to just a handful of years. Born in 1574, he was raised in Shropshire in the West Midlands and graduated from Oxford in 1592. And afterwards, he may have entered the Inns of Court to study law in London. Uh, several of his later poems are dedicated to members of Gray's Inn. And at Gray's Inn, he may have encountered Shakespeare, whose Comedy of Errors was performed there in 1594. And by that time, Barnfield appears to have turned to literary endeavors rather than pursuing a career in law. He published his pastoral complaint, The Affectionate Shepherd, which is an imitation of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, um, as well as the January eclogue of the Shepherd's Calendar, um, with, with Shakespeare's ABABCC stanza. And this... Um, this debut was followed in 1595 by Cynthia, a panegyric to Queen Elizabeth in 19 Spenserian stanzas, which was published together with a small sequence of sonnets, which is the reason we're talking about him in this video. A final collection of his poems was published by John Jaggard. This appeared in 1598, and this collection is best known for its brief final section of poems in diverse humors that included two poems that later that were later mis, misattributed to um, mis, misattributed to Shakespeare in the 1599 anthology of poems The Passionate Pilgrim which was published by John Jaggard's more famous brother William William Jaggard would be um, the publisher of Shakespeare's first folio in 1623 and the thinking here is that William Jaggard um, deliberately misattributed um, Barnfield's poems to Shakespeare as a marketing ploy to get people to buy The Passionate Pilgrim. That's one theory, anyway. Um, Barnfield seems to have abandoned his literary aspirations after 1598 and returned to Shropshire, where he died in 1620. And I'm just going to show you one of the poems from um, from the, the 1598 collection. Um, uh, one of the poems from the end, the, the, one of the poems from the diverse humors. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing you this poem because uh, a remembrance of some English poets, because it really gives an idea of who the major figures um the major literary figures were in the late 1590s, starting with Spencer, of course, uh, who died, who would die a year after this was printed, um, and the Fairy Queen, and then uh, Samuel Daniel is mentioned next, and then Michael Drayton, and then finally in the last quatrain there, uh, Shakespeare, who is not praised for his plays, um, but for his long poems, um, um, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. Um, so just, just an interesting, um, just an, an interesting footnote to, to, um, Richard Barnfield before we move on here to Folk Greville. 
There he is. This is a, this portrait is, is a 19th century engraving of um, an earlier Renaissance portrait. So he was born also in the West, the West Midlands, like Drayton. Uh, and in 1564, entered Shrewsbury School at the same time as Philip Sidney, and they became uh, lifelong friends. And uh, he did not attend Oxford like Sidney did. Instead, he went to Cambridge in 1568, but then rejoined Sidney at the court of Queen Elizabeth in 1577, where he became a favorite of the queen and would serve in various office, offices throughout her reign and the reign of James I, for that matter. In 1585, he embarked with Sydney for the Spanish West Indies, um, looking, for, looking for military glory, but he was recalled when Sydney was appointed governor of Flushing, and we know the tragic outcome of that. And after Sydney's funeral in the winter of 1587, he traveled to France and uh, fought alongside the Protestant Huguenots, a cause um, that he cared about deeply, as did his friend Sidney. In 1592, he would become a member of parliament representing Warwickshire and would, um, from that point, ascend the ranks of government. And eventually he was raised to the peerage with the title of Baron Brook in 1621. And that is how he is identified on the title page of his collection of poetry. In 1610, he writes a prose dedication to Sir Philip Sidney, and this was written in preparation for what was to be uh, a planned publication of, of his poetry. Uh, that, that volume, for whatever reason, never materialized, and so his biography of Sidney um, would appear in 1652 as the life of Sidney. And it is, it is certainly a piece of Sidney worship. In 1628, he comes to a sudden and violent end um, when he was murdered by a servant named Ralph Haywood, who himself committed suicide shortly afterward. Um, and in 1633, um, his, his works, his poetic works, certain learned and elegant works was published, and this included the 109 sonnets of Seleca that was um, that we're going to look at later. And again, this was published after his death in 1633. And I'm not sure what motivated uh, his servant to, uh, to stab him to death, but it's, it's rumored that there was a dispute over, um, over Greville's estate. He was getting older and that the servant perhaps realized he was being left out of the will, but I don't know if there is any uh, verification of that story or not. This is an image of Sidney's funeral. This is one of a series of plates that were engraved, commissioned a commissioned uh, a commissioned series of engravings to commemorate Sidney's funeral. And I'm showing it to you because you can see that uh, Folk Greville and another poet there on the right named Edward Dyer were in the were in the funeral procession, and they were actually uh, pallbearers, although they're not doing the heavy work. They're just <laughs> keeping the pall off the ground, um, which, is, which, is, which is kind of funny. But I think that's a pretty cool image. Really just a wonderful, a wonderful volume of engravings. So at this point, we're going to, uh, to, to look at the poetry of these four individuals. We're going to start uh, with Delia, set by Samuel Daniel. Here is the title page um, for the 1592 edition of his poems. Notice that uh, his name does not appear in, on the title page. In fact, the only name um, that will appear on a title page, author's name, will be uh, uh, Folk Greville's name. So here's Delia, published by uh, Simon Watterson who published many of, of Daniel's works, actually. And you'll see that 
a lot of these publishers were located in St. Paul's churchyard. Ideas Mirror, again, um, uh, Drayton did not call them sonnets. He called them Catorzanes originally, or 14-liners, <laughs> published by Nicholas Ling in 1594. Nicholas Ling would publish the, um, the quarto editions of Hamlet about six years later. And then there's Cynthia by Barnfield. To be sold at the west door of Paul's. That is St. Paul's 1595. And then here is certain learned and elegant works of the right honorable folk Lord Brooke. That would be Folk Greville. Um, putting his name right on the title page, which which is unusual um, for for somebody uh, of, of his social class. But, but he was dead at this point. Uh, in 1633. And there's a qualifier on there. Uh, the poems were written in his youth and familiar exercise with Sir Philip Sidney. So, so describing the poems as, as something that he, that, that he, he did when he was younger, um, and then um, mentioning uh, Sir Philip Sidney, uh, whose name was Gold, um, gave him some additional uh, protection. And that came out in 1633. So sometimes students ask me, what's the deal with St. Paul's Churchyard? Why, why are all these publishers um, located it, around St. Paul's Churchyard? So here's, here's a contemporary map of London. This is before the Great Fire that burned down St. Paul's uh, and a good portion of the rest of the city. Uh, there's St. Paul's there. The churchyard is the whole area surrounding the cathedral and um, this apparently is where the, the book printing industry really uh, took hold. Now, not all these publishers were located in St. Paul's Churchyard, but a good many of them were. Uh, Milton, um, John Milton, grew up on Bed Street, Bread Street, just a couple of blocks to the east of St. Paul's. His father was a scrivener uh, or a, a writer, a preparer of documents. Um, I think part of it, too, may have been a, a part of the reason that these, these booksellers and printers... Um, were centralized here is because a, a lot of book printers, they didn't make their money uh, publishing literature. They made their money publishing, uh, printing, printing Bibles and publishing ecclesiastical literature. Um, so this would be a great place to sell it, you know, right around the, the, the biggest church in England at the time. Um, so I think that's probably has a lot to do with it as well. So we're going to start by talking about Daniel's uh, Delia poems. Uh, his defensive rhyme appeared in 1603, and in it, he um, he he dedicated the uh, the defense to William Herbert, the third Earl of Pembroke, whom he had tutored at Wilton House a decade earlier. And in in that dedication, Daniel attributes his development and success as a poet to Herbert's mother, the Countess of Pembroke's influence and support. And I'm going to quote from that dedication here. Having been first encouraged by your most worthy and honorable mother at Wilton, which I must ever acknowledge to have been my best school and thereof always am to hold a feeling uh, and grateful memory. M Mary Herbert has been put forward as the inspiration for the beloved Delia and Daniel sonnets, and the sequence was dedicated to her when it was published in 1592. And in that earlier dedication, Daniel refers to her, to Mary Herbert, as, quote, the judicial patroness of the muses. And what's what I think is more interesting, he apologizes to her in the dedication for his inadvertent involvement in in the greedy printer Matthew Lunas's unsanctioned edition of her late brother Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Stella a year earlier, like I said, in which 27 of his own uncorrected sonnets also appeared. And he assevers here, and I think he might be a little disingenuous when he says that, but he claims that the decision to publish the rest of the poems, uh, of the rest of the Delia sonnets, was made for no other reason than to maintain, maintain control over his work. He says, I am forced to publish that which I never meant to publish. But I don't know if I believe that entirely. 
So we're going to look at, um, I've got five sonnets up here. Um, some of these sonnets are, are in our textbook, but I've also included a couple uh, that are not for reasons that I will explain when I get to them. So uh, sonnet nine, we'll talk about first. This is, uh, this is one that's in our text and it's, it's a superbly wrought English sonnet. Each quatrain beginning with the phrase, if this be love. It is also exceptionally morose. The speaker's expressions are typical Petrarchan fair, futility, despair, insomnia, solitude, unremitting frustration, the never resting stone of care to roll, he says in an allusion to Sisyphus. And of course, uh, paradox is a common literary device. In the final couplet, with its haunting echo of the first line of the poem, the speaker describes love as something at once horrible and pleasurable. If this be love, to live a living death, oh, then love I, and draw this weary breath. Sonnet 18. In Renaissance sonnets, it is common practice for the poet to catalog all the captivating physical features of his beloved. And this idealized description is called a blazon. This is a term derived from the study of heraldic devices. Uh, blazon, is, 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 uh, uh, blazon is French for uh, shield. It is also a verb. So Daniel blazons his beloved in sonnet number 18 beginning with her eyes, that's a frequent starting point for Petrarchan sonnets, and then proceeding down to her feet at the end of the second quatrain. So given to hyperbole, abstruse exoticism, and histrionic affectation, it is sometimes hard to take these expressions seriously. Uh, they are sometimes written with deliberate irony, and Shakespeare openly mocks the convention in, in, uh, in his sonnets, uh, famously so. Daniel's take here is noteworthy in that he used the blazon not only to complete a portrait of the beloved through the accumulation of rich details, her, her golden hair, her ivory skin, the pearly teeth, and so forth, but also to fantasize her disintegration. So, uh, the objectification and fragmentation of her body culminating with her hard heart in the final couplet allows him to imagine a momentary liberation from her thrall. And I'll let, uh, I'll let his readers decide to what extent they are disturbed by, uh, by that dissolution. It's not unusual, we're looking at Sonnet 35 now, it's not unusual for Renaissance sonneteers to pay tribute to their poetic forebears, often in ways that draw attention to their own learning and cultural sophistication, while also attempting to preserve a modicum of humility and courtly timorousness. In number 35, Daniel compares his beloved to Petrarch's muse, Laura, yet emphasizes the inferiority of his own poetical skills compared to the Italian master. It's lines three through eight. But be that as it may, Delia's, or Daniel's love is no worse off for his talent. He says, I love as well, though he could better show it. This sonnet is also interesting in that the third quatrain supports the identification of Delia with Mary Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, one of the most prominent, munificent, and talented patrons of poetry throughout the 1590s. So here is Sonnet 52. Let others sing of knights and paladins in aged accents and untimely words. Paint shadows in imaginary lines which well the reach of their high wits records. But I must sing of thee and those fair eyes authentic shall, shall my verse in time to come. When yet the unborn shall say, Lo, where she lies, whose beauty made him speak that else was dumb. These are the arcs, the trophies I erect, that fortify thy name against old age. And these thy sacred virtues must protect against the dark and time's consuming rage. Though the error of my youth in them appear, 
suffice, they show I lived and loved thee, dear. So in the third quatrain of this sonnet, the poet boasts that his verses will immortalize the beloved Delia. And this is a theme that Shakespeare takes up with obsessive determination in his sonnets. But um, the poem's, its chief interest lies in his claim to authenticity as compared to the extravagant invention of writers of chivalric romance. And that second line, the aged accents and untimely words, is undoubtedly an allusion to Daniel's contemporary, Spencer, whose three-book Fairy Queen had appeared a couple years earlier. And looking now at sonnet number 55, the significance of this poem is that it links Delia to, to Sidney's sister, Mary Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, whose residence, Wilton House, was and, and, and still is uh, located uh, about four miles west of the city of Salisbury near the Avon River. And that's referenced here, that river is referenced here in the third quatrain. Daniel served at Wilton House as tutor to Mary's son, William Herbert, in the early 1590s, and, and he collaborated with her on a pair of classical tragedies based on the life of Mark Antony. In the third quatrain, uh, Daniel expresses his determination not to seek patronage at the court of Elizabeth or to write plays for London's professional theaters. The River T Thames, mentioned here, is actually a metonym for London. None other fame mine unambitious muse affected ever but to turnize thee. All other honors do my hopes refuse, which meaner prized and momentary be. For God forbid I should my papers blot with mercenary lines with servile pen, praising virtues in them that have them not, and basely attending on the hopes of men, no, no, my verse respects not Thames nor theaters, nor seeks it to be known unto the great. But Avon, poor in fame and poor in waters, shall have my song where Delia hath her seat. Avon shall be my Thames and she my song. No other prouder brooks shall hear my wrong. So turning now to Drayton, Ideas Mirror. Edmund Spencer uh, deliberately began his poetic career writing pastoral poetry before graduating to epic, and Michael Drayton would pursue a similar course. After publishing The Shepherd's Garland in 1593, in which one of Roland's rustic companions observes, Colin, that is Spencer, lays his pipes to gauge and is to ferry gone, a pilgrimage. That's from the third eclogue. Drayton followed, with, uh, followed his Shepherd's Garland with a sonnet sequence, Ideas Mirror, and then gradually worked his way through uh, more ambitious genres until he felt poetically equipped to attempt a long-form poem on the scale of the fairy queen. And this um, eventually um, became the, the grandiose encyclopedic, encyclopedic polyobion. Uh, so throughout this period, uh, the sonnet sequence, whose title, as I said earlier, was shortened to idea in 1599, continued to evolve through successive editions with new sonnets, which he originally called Amers, being added and others withdrawn and by 1619, the sequence had grown to a total of 63, only 20 of which were included um, in the original 1594 edition. So we're going to look at uh, seven of Drayton's sonnets. And again, a number of these uh, are not included in our selection, and I'll explain uh, why that is. Um, so this first one, number 22 in the 1594 edition, um, the first line is my heart imprisoned in a hopeless isle, is one of the sonnets that did not make it into the final version of the sequence in 1619. And it shows Drayton's inventiveness, his, his, his powers of invention, his imaginative gift for borrowing materials that have no obvious connection with love. In this case, it's the myth of Icarus, who escaped from prison um, 
on the island of Crete, uh, flying on artificial wings that melted when he flew too close to the sun and he plunged into the ocean and died. Um, and he takes that story and adapts it to Petrarchan conventions. Um, those conventions being the poetical eagle's art, he says, that framed him wings with feathers of his thought. So he identifies himself with Icarus and identifying himself as such flies on the wings of Posey. So the end of the poem comes as no surprise, but it offers a really delightful paradox. Down fell he in thy beauty's ocean drenched, yet there he burns in fire that's never quenched. Sonnet number 40, My Heart, the Anvil Where My Thoughts Do Beat, is one of the 20 from the 1594 edition, although we're looking at the, the, the version that appeared in 1690, 1619. And this suggests that Drayton retained confidence in the poem's merits throughout the duration of his career. Once again, it's a poem that puts on display his remarkable powers of invention. In this instance, it's his ability to sustain a metaphor, describing the physical and mental effects of love as a smithy where sexual desire is forged. The hellish imagery in this poem, which is something Drayton excels in, culminates in the final couplet with its allusions to the classical underworld. With Sisyphus thus do I roll the stone and turn the wheel with Damodixion. It is worth noting that Vulcan, the Roman god of fire and metalworking, was cuckolded by his wife Venus, and in some versions of the Ixion story is the inventor and or operator of the wheel to which Ixion is bound for eternity. So now we're going to look at some sonnets that are not in our textbook. This one loves lunacy, number 41 in 1619. This is one of the few that has a title attached to it. So this is the first of several sonnets that we're going to look at uh, that did not appear in the first edition of Idea uh, in 1594. And what's, what's really remarkable about these later editions is the extremity of Drayton's passion and the increased grotesqueness of his images, as you're about to see. In this poem, uh, he increases the pitch of Petrarchan paradoxes to the point that the poet tilts toward madness. Noteworthy here is the clinical description of the symptoms of melancholy in the second quatrain, and the phrase, bedlam-like, thus raving in my grief, in line 10, which is an allusion to the famous Bethlehem Hospital, uh, which had served as a facility, some might describe it as a dump site, for the mentally ill, starting perhaps as early as the 14th century. Why do I speak of joy or right of love, when my heart is the very den of horror, and in my soul the pains of hell I prove, with all its torments and infernal terror? What should I say? What yet remains to do? My brain is dry with weeping all too long, my sighs be spent in uttering of my woe, and I want words wherewith to tell my wrong. But still distracted in love's lunacy, and bedlam-like thus raving in my grief, now rail upon her hair, then on her eye, now call her goddess, then I call her thief, now I deny her, then I do confess her. Now do I curse her, then again I bless her. We're going to skip number 42 and come back to it at the end of this. Uh, number 46. Plain path experience, the unlearned's guide, her simple followers evidently shows sometimes what schoolmen scarcely can decide, nor yet wise reason absolutely knows. In making trial of a murder wrought, if the vile actors of the heinous deed near the dead body happily be brought, oft to have been proved the breathless corse will bleed. She coming near that my poor heart hath slain, long since departed to the world no more, the ancient wounds no longer can contain, but fall to bleeding as they did before. But what of this? Should she to death be led, it furthers, it furthers justice, but helps not the dead. 
So this is an example of Drayton's penchant for the for the for the grotesque. This sonnet alludes to the belief, which was popular in the Renaissance, um, but was treated with skepticism by educated persons, as we see in that first quatrain. Um, and the idea is that the wounds of a murder victim will bleed afresh in the presence of the perpetrator. Um, and so he 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 compares his heart to to a murdered victim and and uh, idea to the murderer here. Uh, he seems to want to lighten the tone of the poem in the closing couplet. Uh, it's kind of funny, but the poem is it's so morbid, it's so gruesome. I don't know that that uh, he's entirely successful at that. Even, even more bizarre and uh, and deeply disturbing is this sonnet in which Drayton describes the foreign practice, apparently disallowed in England, of, of um, um, medical vivisection, that is, performing dissections on live human specimens. Persons who had been convicted of capital, capital crimes and sentenced to death, um, so performing surgeries and trying out experimental drug treatments on them and keeping the victims alive for as long as possible to gain medical knowledge. As in some countries far remote from hence, the wretched creature destined to die, having the judgment due to his offense, by surgeons begged their art on him to try, which on the living work without remorse, first make incision on each mastering vein, then staunch the bleeding, then transpierce the course, and with their balms recure the wounds again, then poison and with physic him restore. Not that they fear the hopeless man to kill, but their experience to increase the more. Even so, my mistress works upon my ill by curing me and killing me each hour, only to show her beauty's sovereign power. Number 61. So a fairly standard Petrarchan poem this is, in which the poem renounces love only to recant in the final couplet. I include it here in this video, not, not only because it's an especially fine example of a conventional theme um, in Petrarchan poetry, but because the great 19th century painter and sonnet writer Dante Gabriel Rossetti whose work I really admire, proclaimed this to be the finest sonnet ever written. Um, well, you know, I don't know about that, but I, I think his judgment probably was biased by um, a, a troubled love affair that he was having with his best friend's wife, Jane Morris, at the time. But I think it's worth reading. Since there's no help, come let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done. You get no more of me. And I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel our vows, and when we meet at any time again, be it not seen in either of our brows that we one jot of former love retain. Now at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, when faith is kneeling by his bed of death, and innocence is closing up his eyes. Now if thou wouldst, when all have given him over, from death to life, thou mightst him yet recover. So I'm going to go now back to sonnet number 42. Some men there be which like my method well, and much commend the strangeness of my vein. Some say I have a passing pleasing strain, some say that in my humor I excel. Some who not kindly relish my conceit, they say, as poets do, I used to feign, and in bare words paint out my passion's pain. Thus sundry men their sundry minds repeat, I pass not high how men affected be, nor who commends or discommends my verse. It pleaseth me if I my woes rehearse, and in my lines if she my love may see. Only my comfort still consists in this, writing her praise, I cannot write in this. 
So this is an interesting poem commenting on the public reception of Drayton's poetry. What's even more interesting to me about it are the revisions that Drayton would make later that provide a, a glimpse into how the reception of his poems changed in the course of his career. So in the original version of 1594, the first two lines were different. I'm going to put them up here. There they are. Some men there be, which like my method will, and say my verse runs in a lofty vein. So in this version, uh, again, this is the first printing of the poem in 94. Drayton was praised in more conventional terms for his lofty vein, but he later revised the lines to emphasize the strangeness identified with his later additions to the sequence, like the, like the poems that, that we just read bleeding corpses and and vivisection so moving now moving on now to barnfield uh to, to place um his slender volume of sonnets and it's just 20 of them uh in their proper context one must first turn to his long pastoral complaint the affectionate shepherd published in 1594 in the dedicatory stanzas uh, addressed to Lady Penelope Rich, that's Sidney Stella, Barnfield explicitly identifies himself with Daphnis, the shepherd persona of the poem, whose love for his fellow herdsman Ganymede is the source of his melancholy. In The Affectionate Shepherd, his competition for Ganymede's attention is a woman, Gwendolyn, who may perhaps be a surrogate for Penelope Rich, who we are told had uh, loved a lusty youth that now was dead, that may be uh, an allusion to Sydney, and now is doted on by an old man who may be Lord Rich, whom she does not love. She cannot shake him off, do what she can, for he hath vowed to her his soul's last duty. Now, not all scholars agree on, on the identification of uh, Gwendolyn and the old man with Penelope Rich and Lord Rich, but reading the poem as a personal allegory, um, if, if, we accept, if we accept that identification, uh, Charles Blunt, Baron Mountjoy, um, this was Penelope Rich's lover in the 1590s, becomes a viable candidate for uh, Daphnis's crush Ganymede. So while Barnfield may have succeeded at masking the real identities of the persons involved in this double love triangle, the greater controversy lay in the Pope poem's flagrant homoeroticism, and you can look especially at, at um, the, the first section, the first complaint, lines 97 to 108, and then the second lamentation, um, lines 46 to 48, for, for examples of this homoeroticism. He uses the same stanza, the ABABCC stanza popularized by Shakespeare a year earlier in Venus and Adonis, although Spencer had also employed the same stanza um, in the January eclogue of the Shepherd's Calendar. Daphnis uses these conventions, the conventions of Petrarch and love poetry, to express his desire for another man. As in most sonnet sequences, with the notable exception of Spencer's Amoretti, it is a futile exercise. And by the end of the second day, Daphnis seems suddenly older, and his tone has shifted from passionate wooing with lush imagery of nature and rustic pastimes, hunting and fishing, to rather dull fatherly advice um, that reminds me a lot of Polonius's lecture to his son Laertes in Hamlet. Advice about how to conduct oneself in the morally dubious world of Elizabeth's court. And he starts this with five stanzas that are strangely preoccupied with the indecency of men's long hair. And his complaint finally ends with a rather effete promise to immortalize his unrequited love in verse. My true love for thy sake shall everlasting be, wrote in the annals of eternity. So by the time Barnfield published Cynthia a year later, the affectionate shepherd had already brought upon its author something of a scandal. In a prose apology um, to the Cynthia volume to the courteous gentleman readers, which is undersigned with his real name, uh, Barnfield defends the relationship of Daphnis and Ganymede, which some readers, he says, interpreted 
otherwise than in truth I meant, to wit, the love of a shepherd to a boy. In this, he echoes E.K.'s earlier defense of Habinal's love for Colin Clout and the gloss to the January eclogue of the shepherd's calendar, which he stresses, um, which, which Spencer stresses is a kind of, a platonic kind of love, untainted by the horrible sins of forbidden and unlawful fleshiness, fleshliness. Barnfield does not cite Plato in his own defense, but turns instead to the poet, the Latin poet Virgil, claiming to have imitated the Latin poet's second eclogue, describing the chaste love of the shepherd Corridon for a boy called Alexis, um, highly regarded at the time as the embodiment of poetic excellence and virtue, Virgil he was taught in grammar school, uh, provided Barnfield with an adequate degree of moral cover, and so too perhaps did his new book's dedication to Queen Elizabeth, who's the subject of the title poem Cynthia, which is composed in Spencerian stanzas, 19 of them, and Barnfield proclaims himself here the first poet to imitate the stanza of Master Spencer. Nevertheless, the sonnets that come after the poem Cynthia would seem to belie Barnfield's prefatory apology. He reassumes the persona of Daphnis in the sixth sonnet and identifies his beloved once more as Ganymede in the terminal couplet of number nine. Whatever claims he makes elsewhere for a chaste kind of love for Ganymede's qualities divine as opposed to what E.K. called the disorderly love, which the learned call pederastis, it is impossible for readers not to notice the many explicit expressions of physical desire that are never convincing, convincingly sublimated into the supernal, fleshless, intellectual love that was the Renaissance ideal. And we'll see that in a couple of the sonnets I selected for us. All of these are in our text. So given Barnfield's response to the suspicions aroused by the affectionate shepherd, it is curious that the opening sonnet treats Daphnis's love for Ganymede as a criminal matter, metaphorically speaking. Piercing no skin, interesting line, uh, phrase, Daphnis concedes, Ganymede has committed no crime. With conscience the judge and 12 reasons the jury, Daphnis prosecutes his own sexual arousal, sentencing himself to a lover's melancholy. Your doom is this, and tears still to be drowned when his fair forehead with disdain is frowned. Sonnet 8 is one of the most explicitly erotic in the sequence. Sometimes I wish that I his pillow were, so I might steal a kiss and yet not seen. Images of bees, honey, a dripping honeycomb, echo Daphnis' complaint in The Affectionate Shepherd. I give you some lines there you can look at, 95 to 102. Only here in the sonnet, the emphasis is, emphasis is on Ganymede's angry voice, provoked by the poet's sexual forwardness, symbolized by the bee sting, an obvious phallic metaphor there. Sonnet 10, this is a continuation of Sonnet 9, which tells how Ganymede was formed by Venus from a mixture of Diana's blood and snow taken from the summit of Mount Rodope. Sonnet 10 describes the qualities that, that Ganymede inherited from both goddesses, who interestingly figure prominently in Book 3 of Spencer's Fairy Queen, uh, Diana and Venus. In the third quatrain of Sonnet 10, Daphnis celebrates Diana's influence, his pure, spotless, virtuous mind. Though capable of a chaste kind of love, it clearly is not what Daphnis most desires. As far as I can prove, he loves to be, be, to be beloved, but not to love. He complains at the end. Sonnet 20, this is uh, the last in the sequence, and the chief interest of it, I think, 
is Barnfield's acknowledgement of his literary debt to other undeniably better poets, namely Spencer and Drayton, both mentioned by name in his earlier poem, Remembrance of Some English Poets. But here they're referred to by their pastoral personae. Ah, had great Colin, chief of shepherds all, or gentle Roland, my professional friend, had they thy beauty or my penance penned, greater had been thy fame and less my fall. But since that everyone cannot be witty, pardon I crave of them and of thee pity. So besides the scandal incurred by his verses, the lack of confidence in his own abilities expressed here suggests another reason um, why Barnfield would abandon his literary career by the end of the decade. So moving finally to the poems of Folk Greville, of, of the four discussed here, he is the only one who did not pursue a public literary career for the simple reason that he was a member of the nobility and a courtier, unlike, unlike Daniel, unlike Drayton, unlike Barnfield. Um, and for a courtier, the title of poet would have brought more ridicule than prestige. While writers like Spencer, Daniel, Drayton, and even Shakespeare early in his career availed themselves of the press to gain access to networks of patronage, for men of Greville's social rank, the publication and commoditization of poetical pieces would have seemed indecorous and mean. Although a few of his poems appeared in print here and there during his lifetime, Greville's poetry, like Sidney's, was circulated in manuscript, written primarily for private amusement, to impress a select audience with his intellectual acumen, and to stockpile social cachet at Queen Elizabeth's court. He did not write to support himself or advance his career. By the time of Greville's collected poem, by the time Greville's collected poems finally appeared posthumously in 1633, most of the major poets of the Elizabethan and Jacobean periods, including Daniel, Drayton, and Barnfield, were long dead. And as the title page of, of his volume makes clear, they were yet young boys when many of the poems were written in the late 1570s and early 1580s. So our textbook selection well, even though the 109 Seleka poems are labeled as sonnets, Greville handles the form most more loosely than his contemporaries, and a large number of the poems, due to their length, may be classified instead as songs. The early sonnets were written in imitation of Greville's poet friends, Sidney and Edward Dyer. Unlike Sidney Stella, however, uh, whom we know to have been based on Penelope uh, Devereux, the living precedent for Seleka, which means celestial one, remains a mystery. Sometimes the poet addresses her as Cynthia, which seems to be when he's talking about her in the chaste idealized form, sometimes as Myra or Mira, while the poet himself in several places is identified as Philocell or uh, Miraphil. The poems do appear to be organized roughly in chronological order of composition. The later pieces, starting with number 88 in particular, tend towards greater abstraction, shifting away from themes of Petrarchan love to address more philosophical and religious concerns, which puts Greville in company with poets like Shakespeare and especially uh, John Donne. By the time we get to number 109, the poet is no longer talking about the internal struggle between chaste love and carnal desire or his broken heart, but rather the spiritual corruption of his country. Impiety, O Lord, sits on thy throne, which makes thee living light a god unknown. That's a refrain in number 109. Uh, Petrarchan supplication in this poem and appeals to the beloved become prayers for salvation. Rather, sweet Jesus, fill up time and come to yield the sin, um, her everlasting doom. So the selection that we have does not have nearly enough of the early sonnets. So I'm going to redress that here. Uh, starting with number two. 
And what strikes me in this poem is the poet's comparison of his beloved to a hunting dog. Uh, so Selleck as a hunting dog, hardly a flattering metaphor, but entirely conventional in its depiction of, of her as cruel in her treatment of him. I find the, um, the erotic connotation of the final couplet uh, to be quite hilarious. A fair dog, which so my heart does tear asunder, that my life's blood my bowels overfloweth. Alas, what wicked rage conceals thou under these sweet enticing joys thy forehead showeth? Me whom the light-winged god of long hath chased, thou hast attained, thou gavest that fatal wound, which my soul's peaceful innocence hath raised, and reason to her servant humor bound. Kill, therefore, in the end, and end my anguish. Give me my death. Methinks even time upbraideth the fullness of the woes wherein I languish. Or, if thou wilt I live, then pity pleadeth help out of thee, since nature hath revealed that with thy tongue thy bitings may be healed. Sonnet number seven. The world that all contains is ever moving, the stars within their spheres forever turned, nature the queen of change to change is loving, and form to matter new is still adjourned. Fortune our fancy god to vary liketh, place is not bound to things within it placed, the present time upon time passed striketh. With Phoebus' wandering course the earth is graced. The air still moves, and by its moving cleareth. The fire up ascends, and planets feedeth. The water passeth on, and all lets weareth. The earth stands still, yet change of changes breedeth. Her plants which summer ripes and winter fade. Each creature in unconstant mother lieth. Man made of earth, and for whom earth is made, still dying lives, and living ever dieth. Only like fate sweet Mira never varies, Yet in her eyes the doom of all change carries. Number seven uh, exemplifies Greville's loose treatment of the sonnet form. It has four quatrains rather than three for a total of 18 lines rather than the typical 14. The theme of change, of mutability, um, of mutability as a state of matter. The, the elementals, air, earth, fire, water, are mentioned in the third quatrain, as well as the condition, uh, mutability being the condition of the natural world and man within it. Uh, the passage of time, the inevitability of death, uh, anticipate the preoccupations of Greville's later post-Petrarchan poems, as well as the sonnets of Shakespeare. Here, however, it is a commentary on the one constant feature of his beloved identified here as Mira, possibly punning on the word mirror. And that feature is, of course, her changeability, her fickleness, which comes out in that final couplet. Sonnet number 10. This poem in three octaves with an A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C rhyme pattern explores the familiar Petrarchan conflict between virtuous love, that is, love inspired by the glory of Seleca's beauty, and the lower passions that corrupt that ideal, a benighted love that, Lucifer-like, has fallen from heaven into the disgrace of his darkened mind. In the second octave, he confesses himself a sinner, selfish, vain, dishonest, as one unworthy of love, and then in the final octave, there's this desperate attempt at recovery to restore love to its rightful place, free of lust, where his beloved's sweet glories must, as ideas only, be embraced. Love of man's wandering thoughts, the restless being, thou from my mind with glory wast invited, glory of those fair eyes, where all eyes, seeing virtues and beauty's riches, are delighted. What angel's pride, or what self-disagreeing, what dazzling brightness hath your beams benighted, that fallen thus from those joys which you aspired, down to my darkened mind you are retired? Within which mind, since you from thence ascended, truth clouds itself, wit serves but to resemble, envy is king, at others good offended, 
Memory doth worlds of wretchedness assemble. Passion to ruin passion is intended. My reason is but power to dissemble. Then tell me, love, what glory you divine, yourself confined within this soul of mine. Rather, go back unto that heavenly choir of nature's riches and her beauties placed, and there in contemplation feed desire, which, till it wonder, is not rightly graced. For those sweet glories which you do aspire must as ideas only be embraced, since excellence in other form enjoyed is by descending to her saints destroyed. Number 57. Selica, you blame me that I suffer not absence with joy, authority with ease. Selica, what powers can nature's inside blot? They must look pale without that feel disease. You say that you do, like fair Tagus streams, swell over those that would your channels choke, yielding due tribute unto Phoebus' beams, yet not made dry with loss of vapor smoke. Selica, tis true, birds that do swim and fly, the waters can endure to have and miss. Their feet for seas, their wings are for the sky, nor error is it that of nature is. I, like the fish bequeathed to Neptune's bed, no sooner taste of error, but I am dead. This is a clever sonnet that follows Shakespeare's standard approach to the English form with three closed quatrains. That is, the last line of each quatrain ends with a period and a couplet. So here, Selica has scolded Philocell for his melancholy protests against her commands for him to, to leave her alone, claiming that it goes against nature to suffer disappointment without sorrow and complaint. They must look pale without that feel disease within, he says. In the second quatrain, he anticipates her counter-argument that she is no less subject to the laws of nature than he is, and yet, like a river, can overcome obstacles and endure the sun's beam without drying out completely. She flows on. She, she gets on with life. And he, he concedes her argument in the third quatrain, but points out that nature is various in its forms. And while some are able to adjust to certain kinds of change, he uses the, um, the example of birds that do swim and fly, and therefore waters can endure to have and miss. But others, like himself, are not. I, like the fish, no sooner taste of air, but I am dead. Number 84. This sonnet is a, a farewell to Cupid, whom the poet addresses in a large number of the early sonnets in the sequence. And it's one of several in, at this point um, that lead up to number 88, which marks a clear shift in tone and, uh, uh, and, and focus in the sequence, moving away from uh, Petrarchanized complaints toward more philosophical, more political, more, more religious and spiritual uh, concerns. Farewell, sweet boy, complain not of my truth. Thy mother loved thee not with more devotion, for to thy boy's play I gave all my youth. Young master, I did hope for your promotion. While some sought honors, princes' thoughts observing, many wooed fame, the child of pain and anguish, others judged inward good, a chief deserving. I, in thy wanton visions, joyed to languish. I bowed not to thy image for succession, nor bound thy bow to shoot reformed kindness. Thy plays of hope and fear were my confession. The spectacles to my life was thy blindness. But Cupid, now farewell, I will go play me with thoughts that please me less and less betray me. Number 100, which is in our text, coming after the poet's farewell to love in sonnets 85 to 87. Number 100, with its first line, in night when colors all to black are cast, is among those late poems addressing more ponderous questions of state governance and religions. religion. 
Here, this, this sonnet is often anthologized today. It might be Greville's most recognized poem, the Petrarchan trope of the insomniac lover lying in bed, populating the darkness with images of the beloved, tormented by memories of rejection or forced separation. Here, it becomes the, the, the darkness, the sleepless bed becomes the site of a meditation on on the imagination racked by a guilty conscience, deprived of the consolation of spiritual light. Images of self-confusedness, which hurt imaginations only see. And from this nothing seen tells news of devils, which but expressions be of inward evils. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this video on Elizabethan sonneteers.